see everybody here tonight. Um, so good evening to everyone here. Uh, I'm thankful that you're here. Thankful that you have chosen to come back to uh, this place to worship God, to learn about Him more, and to hopefully learn how to be a better Christian or how to serve Him better than yesterday. Uh, I didn't get a really good chance to do this uh, earlier, but thank you all so much for the love and the support. Um, Ms. Joan, thank you for your sandwiches. They were delicious. Um, and thank you everyone else who uh, helped make today awesome. Um, it was great and truly, Lake and I are blessed to be here with you. Um, we're thankful for it. Also, thank you for singing as y'all have today. This morning and tonight, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. It is so much easier for, for me to get up here uh, when the singing has been good, and today the singing has been good, I just I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for your prayers. Uh, I, I need them. I'm thankful uh, for everything that you y'all do for us. And so, uh, just wanted to say just how blessed we are to be here, and I hope that we can be a blessing to y'all uh, even more in the future. This morning we talked about the lies that Satan tells us. We talked about how Satan lies to us and how uh, the Bible isn't true, right? And, you know, there's many ways to disprove that statement. But Satan has lied to so many people in this world, and, and so many have gone astray because of that lie. We've talked about how Satan told us that the Christian life is too hard, right? It, we can't possibly hope to have anything in this world that is, you know, pleasing, and yet... The world to come is so much better if we will follow God. We talked about how, you know, possibly the worst lie that Satan tells us is that we have time when we don't. And so we talked about the lies that Satan tells us and we talked about, you know, why we shouldn't fall into that trap. But tonight, instead of lies that Satan tells us, I want to focus on a better uh, subject tonight. I want to focus tonight on the promises that God has made. The promises that He has made that, that are either have already been fulfilled or are being kept at the moment and also the promises that will be kept in the future. Because there's three categories. Those three categories of God's promises. Promises that were kept and were fulfilled. Promises that are being kept and promises that are yet to be fulfilled. And so, I hope you'll follow along tonight in your Bibles because this is sort of a, a progression. Uh, every promise will build on each other. And so, if you have your Bibles tonight, I'd like if you turn to uh, the second chapter of Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. Uh, and we'll be dealing with the same thing that we were dealing with this morning, but on a better note. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, and verses 15 through 17. Uh, God said to Adam, or Moses writes, that then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, excuse me, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And so, excuse me. And so we have this promise, and we, we talked about this morning how the devil came into uh, Adam and Eve's lives, completely uprooted it with his lies, told them that the word of God was not true. But in chapter 3, dealing with the fall of man, as chapter 3 does, as we know how the story goes, <clears throat> it's important that we look at something in, that sometimes isn't taken the way that it needs to be taken. Um, after God had confronted Adam and Eve, after he had you know, said, you know, Why, where are you? Why have you done this? And he was about to throw them out of the Garden of Eden. This is something that he said. 
Uh, in verse 14 of chapter 3, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And verse 15 tells us that I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, later, earlier on in my life, I was thinking, um, you know, women don't like snakes. And that's what God was trying to get at here. Uh, you know, Lakin's whole family, the women on her whole family side, don't like snakes. And I'm not really a big fan of them either. So, I, but, you know, that's not really a, a gender thing, is it? That's more of a just, we don't really like snakes. In fact, that is not talking about the relationship between us and the snake at all. In fact, it is talking about something much grander. This was one of the first, if not the first, prophesied moments for the Messiah. As we know, the serpent was the devil. And Jesus would bruise his head. While Satan would only bruise his heel on the cross. We know that when Jesus died on the cross, yes, it was a tragedy. It was something that was a horrible, horrible thing that mankind did because of the lies that Satan told. And so Satan was able to bruise our Messiah's heel, but Christ, when he rose from the dead, was triumphant. And he bruised Satan on the head. This is one of the first prophecies of Christ. And so we have in Genesis chapter 3, one of God's first promises. But if we keep on going, to Genesis chapter 17, we come to find something a little bit different. Because in Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 1, this is what uh, was going on in Abraham's life. Right? In Genesis chapter 17, we're talking about Abraham, and verse 1 tells us that when Abram when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father the father of a multitude of nations. The first thing I want us to notice here is that God has promised something to Abraham. God promised to make him the father of many nations. And as we know, as we go on through the Bible, as we go through um, what, what we see, is that the covenant between Abraham and God was, would sprout, would give rise to the nation of Israel. And by going through the Bible a little bit more, we find that because of God's covenant with Abraham, the children of Israel would be God's chosen people. But why were they chosen? Were they chosen because of some weird coincidence? Or were they chosen for a reason? Why did God want a people of his own? It was because he needed a way to bring Jesus into the world. Because of their status as God's chosen people and because of the laws that they had to keep and because of, of all the many reasons that, all the many ways that they kept themselves clean from all the other outside sources, even though they failed at that. God was able to bring the Messiah into the world. See, God kept these promises. And He kept these promises for a reason. In Isaiah, in chapter 53, probably one of my favorite um, places to go when I want to 
bring somebody's attention to Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 53, in verses 4 through 6, this whole chapter is talking about Jesus. But in verses 4 through 6, we read this, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was cursed, crushed, for our iniquities, the chastising for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. We keep going in verse 7 and we read, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to salt slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit put in his mouth. This whole chapter and what we read... He's talking about our Lord being tortured, being crucified for us. By his stripes we are healed is, is not a metaphor. It is a literal thing. Because the blood that was shed, was shed on that cross that Jesus shed for us, God here is promising us that because of his sacrifice, because of his love for us, we can be healed from the sin-sick disease that we have. Because if we keep going in the Bible and we keep going into the New Testament now, we find not promises that were kept, but promises that are being kept. See, the promises that we have discussed so far are promises that have already been fulfilled. Christ already died for us. He already uh, gave us this way into eternal life. He already was uh, tortured and His stripes already are able to heal us. But now we talk about, we need to talk about kept promises that are being kept. And the first one is that God loves us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We all know this verse. And it's used so much in today's world that I hope it's not taken less seriously. Because it is one of the most beautiful verses in the whole Bible. That all of the prophecies that were talking about Jesus cumulated into this one verse. Cumulated into this one verse. That because He loved us so much, He was willing to do what Isaiah 53 said. That because He loved us so much and He died for us, He was able to do what Genesis chapter 3 said. That He was able to crush Satan. And to bring about eternal life for all of us. It is only because of His love that He, was, that he did this. And you see, good people, it is ongoing. Now this promise that Jesus would love us did not stop in the first century. It didn't stop until He was crucified. It didn't, it didn't stop when... You know, so many of us turned our backs on Him. It is ongoing. And it's never going to stop. Because God promises us that He will love us. Even though we cannot earn that love. There's nothing that we can do as a sinful people to earn this promised love. And yet... God still does it. Isaiah 54, verse 10, uh, tells us that 
The mountains shall depart and the hills shall be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor my covenant of peace be removed. It's Isaiah. That's God talking. He's talking to his people that the peace that God has for us and the kindness that he wants to give us will never be removed from us, from his people. We serve a God of mercy. No matter what we do, no matter who we were or what we have been, God's love is enough to save us. Jesus' stripes are enough to heal us. And He has crushed the adversary. And so tonight, the last promise that I want us to look at, uh, and then the lesson will be yours, is in Philippians 3, uh, verses 20 and 21. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 is not a promise that was kept. It's not a promise that is currently being kept either. It is a promise that will be kept. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21 tell us that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. In Matthew 7, verse 21, the Bible tells us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does the will of my Father in heaven. This world is not our home. And God has promised us a home. And it's not this world. Our home is in heaven. You know, I, I look at all of... I follow a lot of people back from my hometown on uh, Facebook. Uh, obviously, I grew up there. Um, and I see so many posts that aren't exactly loving. I see a lot of posts that aren't exactly something that maybe... Jesus would post. And I see so many ideas about America. I see so, many, I see so much patriotism. And, and I'm not saying that anything is wrong with patriotism. I love America. I love that we have this freedom that we have. I, I am a patriot. Absolutely. But I don't want us to confuse America with heaven. Because as great as America is, or as great as America has the ability to be, it will never be heaven. It will never give us what heaven can give us. And so I don't ever want anyone to think that we shouldn't be patriotic. I don't want ever to let anyone think that I think that we should never you know, love our country and serve our country and, and do what is best for our country or for any other uh, group or affiliation. But I do truly want to stress that heaven is our home. And the things that we do here ought to help our situation in our next life. It should not be to try to make America great if it is contrary to the doctrine of God. If we do not have love, then we have nothing. And if we cannot be loving in our want and desire to be patriotic. 
then perhaps we need to take a step back and think about where we are going and who we serve. Because good people, we have a home in heaven that was promised to us from the beginning. Genesis chapter 3 talked about a Messiah a Savior for this world. And the Jews, many of them missed it. But to those who took it, they got to be a part of the first generation of Christians. The first generation of God's true people. The people that God had chosen before the foundations of the world. And we here today, if we are a Christian, if we have been bought back, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, we too can have that as well. Our citizenship is not in Huntsville. Our citizenship is not in Alabama, nor is it in America or the world. If we are a Christian, our citizenship is in heaven. And that is one of the best things that I can think of. That though this world has its heartaches, it has its strife, and it has its suffering, this is a, we live in a fallen, fallen world. And you know, there are things that happen in this world that just aren't good. But we're going to somewhere that is better. We're going to somewhere where we won't have to worry about wearing glasses. We won't have to worry about losing those that we love. We don't have to worry about the temptations that are always flooding us and trying to, to devour us. We don't have to worry about the lies that Satan tells. Truly, we're going to a place better than any of us can imagine. I truly can't begin to imagine how good it is. But 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 3 through 4 tell us that this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This, this home in heaven is available for everyone. No matter ethnicity, class, economic situation, country, continent, or anything else. I think it's amazing that in Africa there are people worshiping today. There are people that are worshiping the way that God intended for them to worship. I think it's amazing that there are people even in Russia and the Ukraine and Poland today that are worshiping in spirit and in truth. That even though we may be separated by continents and languages, and ethnicity, and all these other things. We are united in Jesus. I hope that all of us here have held on to those promises that God has given us. God has a really good track record with His promises. You know, he's, he's never broken one yet. And He has promised us heaven where we can be with Him forever. I don't know what heaven is. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the ways that heaven is described is probably only described in a way that we can understand, try to get a grasp of how good it is. 
And so a lot of the ways that heaven is described in the Bible is probably metaphoric. But one thing that I do know is that it will be an eternity with our God. And it will be better than anything that we can imagine. And so today, if you have not taken hold of these promises, today if you have never been baptized, you've never put on Christ, and you've never let His blood wash you and cleanse you of your sins, I pray that you'll do that today. Today, if you have sinned in your life, you're a Christian, but you need to repent of that. Please come forward as we stand and sing.